Uh, my name is Colin Blake, uh, and I am the director at a place called Moonshine University. I'm Andrew Wiebrink. Excuse me, everybody hear me there? I'm Andrew Wiebrink. I'm the director of uh, Spirits Research and Innovation for Independent State Company, the world's largest manufacturer of uh, Cooper's products. And what we're here today to get into is what happens to alcohol, and we're primarily going to be talking about uh, ethanol for time's sake, but what happens to ethanol uh, both inside of one's body and in the barrel? It, we had to rehearse that like four times to get that time. Here, so <laughs> we're, we're, we're almost there. A couple more times. A couple more times, yeah. Yeah. Um, when the warm up audience leaves, we'll, uh, we'll <laughs> yeah, knock it exactly. for, the, for the live show. Um, so, what we're going to be doing is really exploring how these two phenomena are different. Because, really, when you're looking at the conversion of ethanol um, in both the, the body and the barrel, um, you are looking at how <clears throat> ethanol grows, evolves changes and that's through catalysts um, and similar catalysts in some to some extent indeed um, so we're going to be looking at uh, how um, oxygen and dehydrogenase um, really change ethanol and uh, process it through the, the barrel and the body could have said it better myself all right so Starting with the barrel, if we're going to talk about how oxygen interacts with these primary alcohols, and just to clarify, it's not just ethanol that is in the barrel. There are a lot of different primary alcohols, but as Colin said, for time's sake, uh, we're, going to, we're going to concentrate on ethanol Let's today. talk about how oxygen gets into the barrel, uh, because in my opinion, it, has, it, it really is pretty cool. So the majority of the oxygen over the lifetime of, let's say, barrel's maturation period, about 63% of that uh, around 63% is going to come in through the joints and I'm going to assume there's probably some people in here that aren't familiar with barrel construction. Uh, the joint, I've outlined it up here, I've also rolled this bad boy over here just to make sure everybody can see this, it's right where two stays come together, right? So throughout the course of a barrel's life in a warehouse, 63% of the oxygen that comes in and is going to interact with that whiskey is going to come in through those joints. Now, uh, about 15% uh, is going to come in through the crows uh, and through the bung. And the cool thing about oak is that it is characterized as ring porous. And what that means is that it is part of a family of trees in which if you were to make a barrel out of it, it can hold liquid, but it allows the exchange of gases. So about 22%, and that number probably varies over the course of maturation, higher in the beginning, lower towards the end of the maturation, about 22% of all the oxygen that comes in, which is a pretty good amount, is going to come right through the wood uh, itself. Uh, which is pretty cool. So that, I guess, addition of oxygen into the barrel itself is a term that we kind of loosely, we loosely call oxygenation. And by definition, oxygenation is going to be oxygen entering a system. And in the case of everybody in this room, the oxygen is, or the, the system is going to be the barrel, starting from the outside surface of the stave and working its way in. Uh, now, once we have the oxygen in the barrel, some cool stuff starts to happen, and a lot of it is, well, most of it is flavor related, right? And it's going to be due to a process that we call oxidation. Now, in this industry, you're going to use those terms interchangeably, and for the most part, it's okay, but it's really important to define which each one of those are. So oxygenation, as we talked about, mechanical process, all right? Oxidation is a chemical process, all right? So that's when we're going to take oxygen and turn some different things into some, or turn some things into some different things through the exchange of electrons, or as it's defined right here, the process of being oxidized. Now, as I put right here, we tend to use this word incorrectly. It's kind of an umbrella term that it, it kind of encompasses a number of different flavor developing processes, and that's perfectly fine. But again, oxidation of ethanol is what we're going to be uh, talking about moving forward, or the oxidation of these primary alcohols. Now, when a primary alcohol comes into contact with oxygen, what's going to happen is we're going to get a couple different byproducts, right? We're going to get some aldehydes and we're going to get some acids, okay? So with respect to ethanol itself, we're going to oxidize ethanol and we're going to get acid aldehyde. Did I say that one right? Yes, you did. All right, good. Just check it. We're going to further oxidize that compound and get an acid. And that's essentially the end of the oxidation chain of ethanol, but there's still some stuff left going on. Uh, that we deem pretty important, especially in terms of flavor creation and overall quality of the, the spirit, the whiskey, the beer, whatever's going to be in the barrel, right? So, byproducts, aldehydes, 
acids. Both are good for the most part. I mean, you can get some off notes from either one of those, but they're responsible for flavor. They're responsible for color. So a lot of good things come out of the oxidation of ethanol, which is the primary alcohol in the barrel. So in this instance, acid aldehyde is going to be responsible for, uh, as we'll find out later, some not so good things, but in the barrel, it's responsible for some great things, yeah. right? So that nice kind of green apple taste that you can get, uh, fresh fruit, uh, result of aldehyde. Uh, acetic acid, which we normally associate kind of that main compound of vinegar, um, in smaller dilutions, uh, like we have here in a barrel, it's going to be like ripe fruit. So it actually is something that is considered pretty pleasant. But the cool thing about the acids is not just their smell or their contributions to color. It's that when they interact with an alcohol, they, uh, through the process called esterification, we get some really, really cool flavors. And the flavors are going to depend on the acid that's interacting and also the alcohol interacting. And that process is called esterification. And to me, this is kind of the end game, well, almost the end game of this oxidation of ethanol, right? I mean, it's not necessarily that esterification requires oxygen, but it does require the byproducts of alcohol oxidation. So uh, I said we're not done yet. There is one more process, and this one's pretty cool. Uh, transesterification, all right, and that is kind of the end game there. So transesterification, essentially what that means is that we can take our newly created ester, which smells really, really good, that guy can go back, it can combine with a totally different alcohol, it doesn't have to be ethanol, it can be something, amyl alcohol, something totally different, and it can create another ester and another alcohol, and then so on and so forth. So that is kind of the end game, in my opinion, of the oxidation of ethanol in the barrel. Uh, not so not not so similar in the body is that correct a little bit different it is a little bit different um and thank you for perfectly teeing up my next slide all right well it's like we rehearsed that it is like we rehearsed it um all right so it is a little bit different of what happens inside your body so ethanol um even though it starts the journey in a fairly similar way um it, it's going to go through a much different process now the catalyst that was happening inside of that barrel was interaction with oxygen. Now, inside of your body, it's not oxygen that's going to be changing ethanol and taking you through this process. It is dehydrogenase. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with dehydrogenase, let me just break it down for you really simply. Um, so D, right? Removal, getting rid of. Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Um, then <laughs> A's, uh, which means an enzyme. So this is an enzyme that is going to remove hydrogen atoms. And when you remove hydrogen atoms from a molecule structure, it changes that molecule structure, which means we are turning it into something else. Now, when we are looking at this whole pathway that we're gonna be talking about, um, there's two different things we're gonna talk about. The organs involved, <coughs> because really these are the main ones that you see up here. Uh, the brain, the stomach, um, the intestines, the liver, but the reality is, is alcohol actually interacts with all the different organs in your body, but we're just going to concentrate on those today. And then we're going to talk about the metabolic cycle of ethanol inside your body and what it turns into and how it ultimately get, gets processed through your body. Now the organs involved, the first one we're going to talk about um, is, is the brain, and really we could just do a whole big session on the brain because the chemistry of what happens to your brain um, is impressive. But when you actually ingest alcohol, it takes anywhere between one to five minutes for ethanol to reach your brain, which can seem uh, a little untrue, particularly if you've ever had that first sip of alcohol and instantly you just feel relaxed and at ease. Now the reality is, is those are endorphins being released by your brain, and that is more of environmental factors that release your endorphins, because sometimes after a really hard day, um, you can feel calm and relaxed right after you even order your drink. So <clears throat> it actually takes a little bit of time um, for the ethanol to hit there, but there's all this other chemistry um, involved with, with what's happening in the brain. Now, upon ingestion of ethanol, uh, the first place it's going to go after it gets past your esophagus is to your stomach. Now, the stomach is going to get about 20% of that ingested ethanol um, into your bloodstream. That that does not make it into the bloodstream in the stomach is going to go on to the intestine, where about 80% of the ethanol is going to make it into the bloodstream. 
via the portal vein, um, which goes straight to the liver. And the liver is the filter for our circulatory system. So that is really important. And the liver is where about 90% of the ethanol ingested gets processed. 90. 90%. Oh, so what happened to the other 10%? That's what I was getting That's at. a great question, Andrew. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, Are you going to get to that? Actually, I, I will now because who can ignore such a thoughtful, out of the blue question like that? Thank you, sir. Um, so those, that last 10% of ethanol actually doesn't get processed. It actually is going to exit your body um, as urine, sweat, and actually through your breath. Um, and as that alcohol, that ethanol, is exiting your body in the form of breath, it is actually in the same alcohol concentration as it is in your blood. So that's why... Wait a second. Is this why breathalyzers work? That is 100% why breathalyzers work and are so accurate. So they say. Well, I'm going to leave that one alone. Um, so, so once we are in the liver, the liver is where we're really going to start processing um, this ethyl, ethanol. Now, up here you see the, the flow chart, what we're going to talk about here. Now, the, the dehydrogenase are the main things that I'm going to talk about. What's on the kind of bottom of the arrows here? What you see on the top, the NAD plus and the NADH plus, um, those are coenzymes. And they're really important in this process, but for, for time's sake, we're not really going to touch on them. Um, the way you can think about them is, you know when you're out and about and something's going down, and then there's that guy who's like, hold my beer? Those coenzymes are the ones who hold the beer. So that is a good way to think about those. So what happens is this ethanol enters the liver, alcohol dehydrogenates, it's going to knock out some of those hydrogen atoms and turn ethanol into acid aldehyde. So far we're on track with what's happening inside of the barrel. The problem is, is acid aldehyde is highly toxic to the body. You cannot have it in high concentrations in your body, so your body has to process that acid aldehyde very quickly into a more, um, or NERC probably isn't the right word, but less harmful substance. So that is where, <coughs> excuse me, um, we get aldehyde dehydrogenase come into place, and they're gonna go start working on that acid aldehyde and they are going to break it down into acetate. And acetate is a, a fatty acid. It is used for so many parts of um, your daily metabolic process. But what's going to happen is that acetate is going to bind with a, another enzyme and make acetyl-CoA, which is short for acetyl-CoEnzyme A. And that is another common metabolic enzyme that's just going to break down into water and carbon dioxide and leave the body in the normal ways that water and carbon dioxide do. Oh, I see a question uh, from my co which is odd. The amount of times we've been through this, I think I would have answered all your questions. Nope, I got one more. Great. How long does this whole process take here? It looks like you got quite a bit going on. There is quite a bit going on. Only if I had a slide to explain this. So your body <laughs> processes about 7 grams of pure ethanol an hour, which is the equivalent of one standard drink. And that's where that whole kind of uh, saying that you always hear is your body can process one drink an hour. It's because that's how fast your liver and these enzymes can break it down and go through this process. And if you ingest more than one drink an hour, and who's done that? Uh, but essentially it just kind of uh, backs up air traffic control, right? And it, your, your body kind of goes into a, a holding pattern and it has, takes more time to process all that ethanol that is inside of your body. Now there are some cases in which certain folks are absolutely certain components that can break that break the stuff down. Is that true? Correct. Um, there there is uh, about forty percent of certain Asian uh, populations that actually don't um, have an aldehyde dehydrogenase in their body. So what that means is is when they ingest ethanol, um, 
their body builds up with that to toxic uh, acetaldehyde and they actually become really flush and get sick and um, they're what would be considered alcohol intolerant or an allergy, but generally it's because their bodies are lacking that dehydrogenase to turn that more toxic aldehyde into a more workable acid. Questions? <laughs> Where'd you get the figures for how much uh, oxygen is transferred through the right. stays, pros, above, all, all that? So, so that's a good question. That study was actually done uh, just, uh, probably 15 to 20 years ago uh, by a group. And essentially what they did is they had probes in the barrel that measured the amount of dissolved oxygen going in. And they had different barrels in the set. And they essentially sealed off different parts of the barrels with a wax or a putty. And over the course of the maturation, they measured the amount of dissolved alcohol, or excuse me, dissolved oxygen going into the spirit. Uh, and so that I should have referenced that study and I, I completely forgot to, but that's where that came from.